Wow. Some of you may notice as I was accepting this, I was uh, holding my medicine with me. And this medicine, on the Dakota side, I'm, I'm both Dene, Navajo, and Dakota. Uh, from Minnesota, I spend my childhood, however, as uh, what Paul mentioned, on my mother's land in Dene Ta, the land of the Dene, the, the, uh, the Navajo. And um, my other half of my life has been with our Dakota people, our Bidewakantawa, the dwellers or of the villages of the sacred waters, the sacred lakes. So this is our medicine. This is our tobacco. And um, one of the questions that uh, uh, Father Art had framed in your, in, in your presentation is what inspired our network, what inspired me as one of the many leaders uh, who formed this indigenous environmental network. Um, and I must say, this is my inspiration. I come from a culture or cultures where we've been under attack. I've been part of cultures as indigenous peoples to where we did not have the freedom to express ourselves. I come from a culture to where somehow in the mysteries of colonialism and the governments that come out of colonialism somehow have an attitude about who we are as the First Nation people, as the Aboriginal peoples, as indigenous peoples with an S on people. Many people don't know that we strategically took our front line years ago to Geneva, to the United Nations to call attention that we didn't have collective rights in many of the governments, the nation states of the world. We didn't have collective rights. When we started to organize ourselves as indigenous peoples from every region of the world where there are indigenous peoples that live within nation states, that we all shared some commonality with our relationship with ourselves and with the concepts of Inamaka, Mother Earth, our Grandmother Earth. It seemed we all had something in common. And that journey has taken me throughout the world. I remember in Durban and to Cape uh, to Cape Town, South Africa. One year, I was really fortunate to meet some of the elders of the, the Bushmen, the Bushwomen, the Khoikhoi, the Khoisan peoples. And I was just like in, in awe. And I remember in the translators that we had, they have that clicking sound, you know, woven into the language, as the language was flowing, there was a clicking sound here and there. And they asked where I was from. So I appropriately responded where I was from. In this case, not that I did not ignore my mom and the Dene, but I identified northern Minnesota our homeland of the Eastern Dakotas, the people of the sacred waters, which is our face and our essence, the Great Lakes, and our floral, our floral beadwork, our floral designs. And I said at the conclusion of that, 
I come from the center of the universe. And the translator, I remember, it created a discussion that was pretty long and I was just kind of being patient. And they went back and forth. They even called another person that was in the back forward and they start talking about something. And finally, they were ready, the translator said, well, what did they say? They said, well, they recognize who you are and where you come from. They welcome you here, you know. But uh, they said that they had to talk about when you said you're from the center of the universe. Because everything that they were raised in, in their way, in their teachings, their cosmology, they are from the center of the universe. So there was some confusion. How could this person be from the center of the universe? And here, where they have the cross and they don't have the Big Dipper or the North Star, they have a cosmology that's deep and profound spiritually. Um, so they understood that as indigenous peoples, wherever we come from, that we have a root and we have roots, the biblical cord of our birth, our link to our moms. We know what to do with that as it dries out. We know what to do with it. We know what to do with the, um, the, the, the afterbirth. We're all linked to Mother Earth. We're linked to Father Sky. We're linked to the cosmos, the star nation. So this struggle, why is it that we have a struggle as indigenous peoples? That somehow in colonization of the Americas, Alaska, Canada, Turtle Island, Mexico, the tail, going down to Central America, all the way down to the horn of Argentina, the Western Hemisphere. What was it that was so significant that for peoples to come and colonize and occupy our Western Hemisphere, they were concerned about doing it under international law? So what allowed them to come in and invade our territories. Somehow the role of the church needed to be involved to say that we were less than, that we weren't civilized, that we were savages, that we didn't have a religion. We did not, we weren't, uh, we didn't have song all those certain definitions of what is a civilization. Terra nullis, terra nullis, people without a soul. That allowed politically the excursion, I mean, allowed the encroachment of militarization, imperialism, everything that comes with. So that's why I wanted to say and the response, what inspires me? It's my medicine. It's my tobacco. On the next side of our grannies, the Petlajini Denishle, in our clan, we have this connection to the corn pollen. And the female creative energy in the corn that grows on the top of the corn, very significant, the female creative energy within that corn that we make the corn pollen. And we use that for medicine, for prayer, for blessings. So on one hand, I have corn pollen. and the other hand, I have tobacco. Yeah. Um, 
So on behalf of our, our founders of the Indigenous Environmental Network, uh, uh, I accept this. On behalf of our long struggle of different leadership that have stepped up from a term that we never used 30 some years ago, frontline. Our constituency who put our network together come from the grassroots of Indian country, from the grassroots as indigenous peoples, grassroots as members of our indigenous tribal nations, our governments that we're all very proud of. And we will stand in defense of our sovereignty, in defense of our self-determination. I just came back from our convening of the Global Alliance on the Rights of Nature. I work with some colleagues and friends who have written books on wild law. They've written books on earth-centered law. But I went this year for a purpose because we haven't been able to meet face-to-face -face since Oh, it's been years before the pandemic. But I've been, I've been studying this phenomenon of society, of humanity, reevaluating its relationship to the sacredness of Mother Earth. Some of you who have heard me speak, I talk about that. I challenge humanity throughout the world to reevaluate what your relationship is to walk on the sacredness of the female creative principle of creation with Father Sky, on how precious that is in a society that practices almost in all of its political terrain patriarchy. Removal of people's understanding with the sacredness of Mother Earth. A society that has laws, policies, that objectifies Mother Earth in the same way that humanity, men, objectify their woman, their woman, the woman. So part of our movement as Indigenous Environmental Network has been to challenge environmental protection and how it has been created and to think outside of that box. Elders challenged me in 1990, 91, and 92. And they said, the work that you are doing Tom Goldtooth, the work that we are tasked and mandated to do in this new network, confederacy, this alliance, this medicine circle, as indigenous peoples coming together, focused on the environment and being part of a network, a medicine wheel, is that this is spiritual work. I knew right away these two elders what they were talking about. Because to do this work, and I believe this isn't just as indigenous peoples, it's part of the challenge I give to humanity to reevaluate your relationship to the sacredness of Uchimaka, Inamaka, Mother Earth, Grandmother Earth. When we talk about natural law, what does that mean to indigenous peoples, not only in the North, but indigenous peoples in the global South? We talk about creation. And what does that word mean in indigenous creation? What does that mean? So I understood the reminder and the teachings of those elders that said, you're doing spiritual work. 
This is spiritual work at the highest level. So I tell that to environmental administrative assistants, to AAs. I say that to people that work for the US EPA and the regional offices and the state offices whenever I have that time to do that. And I like to leave that with you here, whether you are passionate about social justice, sustainable justice, sustainability, green engineering, working for peace and justice. Because I just came back from Europe, I was in Italy, and I was asking some folks there, where was it in your knowledge that was passed down to where you had some understanding of what I'm talking about, about your relationship to the sacredness of Mother Earth, but also the waters, the waters of Europe, the waters that come from the glaciers, the waters that are dammed in different places of Europe, and even waters diminishing from drought conditions. They're worried as much as our people are worried in Colorado River area, as people are worried when I was in Senegal, Dakar. A report from uh, UNESCO about, about we're losing our groundwater, especially the groundwater that is a fossil groundwater aquifer, fossil aquifer, it doesn't replenish itself. It doesn't recharge. So I think about that in accepting this award of youth, our youth, our women's societies, our men, and our elders. And within that, I always speak up for the two-spirit, the two-spirit of our nation, of our peoples, who are very fortunate to walk with both spirits and both energy of creation, and how we traditionally have honored them. On the Dakota side, we gift them with tobacco to name our children as well as other uh, acknowledgments. So I'm thinking of all those folks, our women, our elders, our men, our youth, as very important in the formation of this indigenous environmental network. And I come from a people in my generation I come from a generation of activism, if you want to ask that, American Indian Movement, National Indian Youth Council, United Native Americans out of the Bay Area. There's many other societies that came up in the late 60s and the 70s. I was a product of that putting into questions about colonization, not just being a college student. And I was fortunate to spend a couple of years in college. But questioning the system. And through our network, we have grown. because we were also challenged again by our elders, but from our youth. How do you create change? And part of the climate justice movement, I've utilized the terminology. I don't know where it came from, but I remember I spoke to it in uh, Canada, in Toronto, in 2002 or something like that. Systemic change, not climate change. 
How do we change a system? How do we build our power as indigenous peoples? How do we break loose of colonization? How do we decolonize ourselves? And how do we create power by building alignment with other people in struggle? So we've been part of a movement of creating, for an example, the Climate Justice Alliance, CJA, you can go to their website. Grassroots for Global Justice Alliance. We decided to organize with people in struggle, people that understand the passion of struggle, people of color, black people of color. And yes, we can define people of color if need be. As indigenous peoples also, how do we align ourselves as first peoples, as indigenous peoples that are lifting up our inherent relationships, our inherent relationship? We are the first peoples here. How do we lift up now, this is where we're at, indigenous law, indigenous jurisprudence that recognizes our original instructions, our teachings, and our traditional indigenous knowledge, our languages, our concepts. And that was part of the message that I brought with me with the blessings of spiritual authorities at this Global Alliance and Rights of Nature in Italy, is we can, we can work with you, our allies, who are not indigenous, on breaking down Eurocentric approaches to Earth-centered um, phenomena. But we are also needing to walk and to be in our canoe in the same river as other folks have their own boats. This comes from the Haudenosaunee, Haudenosaunee uh, principles. So how can we be part of the earth-centered movement but also lifting up our indigenous law, our indigenous jurisprudence based upon our inherent relationship so that the recognition of the Okanagi River in Aotearoa in New Zealand where that river has more rights than the Maori people do. So how do we work together in our struggles so that we're lifting up the rights of indigenous peoples, where there are indigenous peoples. So that's, that's kind of where we're at, uh, indigenous principles of just transition, to where we have to define what just transition means to us as indigenous uh, peoples. And you can find that on our webpage, indigenous principles of just transition. So we're still involved with the struggle uh, we're still part of making movement for the phase out and keeping fossil fuels in the ground. We're bringing 50, 16, uh, 16 people as part of our indigenous delegation to Egypt for the Conference of the Parties 27, the 27th year as the Conference of the Parties of Nation States who are coming to this UN meeting not just from the north, but from the south. So we're still involved with that. We're still involved with the CO2 now. What is a carbon pipeline and what does that mean? There's a lot of education, putting together popular education materials. What does loss and damage mean to us with our brothers and sisters from the global south? What is climate finance? and what is climate debt, and what is, how does that relate to climate funds? 
and what's the difference. This is where we all, everyone here, needs to study these things because that's where things are at right now. And yes, I do talk a lot about climate fault solutions. I brought a little booklet uh, with me, Hoodwinked in the Hot House. It's the third volume. It's on my chair. You can Google search that and you can download it. If you want a, a physical booklet, contact our office. We got a couple boxes. But this gives uh, a breakdown on how those different technologies, geoengineering technologies, carbon capture storage, radiation, solar management things, um, CCS, CC, CCS, US carbon capture storage, use in storage, recycling. It goes on. In the meantime, we've been part of reports with Oil Change International, with uh, Rainforest Action Network, with Bank Track researching annually of the amount of investments from the banks increasing the production of fossil fuels, not decreasing. And what is the cover for them to do that? What's the greenwash mechanism? It's these mechanisms of carbon markets and geoengineering technologies that allows the tar sands to continue to pollute. So these are things we really need to educate ourselves on. So with that, there's a lot of other programs uh, uh, building. We're part of a movement of building the grassroots feminism, feminist movement. Simone and other folks in our office are part of a movement with World March of Women with uh, grassroots, uh, um, global grassroots, uh, Alliance and Grassroots International on moving this agenda. And for us in Minnesota, it's our women reevaluating, breaking down that our original economy, indigenous economy, was based upon our woman economy. So these are things that we're lifting up and breaking loose from that colonization and that mindset that we don't have power. We're building power. Power not around militarization, not power around warfare or this patriarchy male dominance, but power that respects the love and compassion of Mother Earth, the love and compassion that we need throughout the world. The message from the Pope but the need to understand that relationship to nature, that relationship to the earth, to humanity, compassion. So that's what I want to leave here with you, and I, I appreciate uh, this award, and I'm going to take it back to our office and, and uh, give it to our leadership team and uh, and post it up on the wall, very, very proud. And uh, so you will be in our, in our prayers uh, as we learn more about Villanova and a lot of the different initiatives I heard at the table. And uh, yeah, we want to get more native students here. I think that'd be good. Yeah, and some uh, native initiatives, and not only here in Western Hemisphere, but throughout the world. Africa, Southeast Asia, the Philippines, Indonesia, the Sami, it's all over that we need to work together. Thank you very much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing you a song here in, 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 in respect of what you've given us. Uh, you can all rise if you can. My grandpa taught me this song, and uh, it could go back over a thousand years many generations, and uh, we do sing this in ceremony. Some of our sun dances is on the Dakota side. <clears throat> Imagine as I'm singing this song, you are reaching out in your own way. You're reaching out in prayer, in meditation. You're reaching out somewhere in your own 
vision. You want, you want to be recognized. You want to be acknowledged by the Creator on however you conceive that. And by being recognized, lifts you up. That's what this song's about. He went to want one yankee. The Kashna de Tipi Tanka, the Kashna Kede Villa Nova University, the Kashna, will you wash day? Midaki a pit the Kashna, will you wash day, the Kashna? Nina Wope the Tanka, the Kashna. This award, the Kashna. Wakan Tanka, the Kashna, Tate Uye Topa, the Kashna, Nga Uchimaka. Ishta wayankie. Hamidakia wase. Thank you. buying time here. <laughs> I don't know if you ever had the opportunity to visit Peru, the Andes in Peru, but Cusco, the center of the Inca world, the empire, they would call, and people say, it's the ombligo. It's the belly button of the world, the center of the world. The indigenous people, the people native to that particular area, and during their time, no one died of hunger. No one was homeless. As opposed to New York, my hometown, 30,000 people will be out in the streets tonight. How many people will be hungry? How the people at that time, in touch with the spirit within them, realizing we all have something to offer, that I can, I can see in, in South Africa and Durban when you, when you said that how people would be, was well, it not here, the center of the world? It's here, each one of us. And I, th I thank you so much for inviting us to challenge patriarchy, to challenge a society which thinks that we have it together, that allows us to diminish the importance of Earth and the people who inhabit it. I thank you for igniting again in our hearts the possibility that each one of us 
is called and can do something to make this a better place for all of us. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that region you talked about, that area, I've been there many times, and just the corn varieties. Um, those corn varieties are more than the chairs in this room. I've seen collections in a big room of the different corns and squashes and beans. When it comes to what I saw with their food system and the spirit of the corn, the spirit of those seeds that go back way long ago and they're still taken care of with deep reverence. You know, that touched my heart when I was there both from the mountain of the Andes all the way down to the Amazon. And, and sure, within that are env even environmental injustice issues with petroleum contamination, you know. And uh, it's very important. I, uh, people that keep track of me, I talk about the matrix, you know. This entity and matrix, it's, it's there. For me, it exists. Who is this matrix? Just like in the movie, as we're trying to, trying to resist, something keeps coming at us, trying to break in our shell of a ship, eh? Our minds are resistant to take our power away. Why are we a threat? Why are we a threat? So I think about those things. Who are, who are those entities that don't want the power of the people of the earth? And a lot of those people are not indigenous, but they come from land and they have knowledge as well. So that's why in our prophecies, we saw the value of, of people that come from Europe, people that come from a settler way Reevaluating their relationship and became part of this wild law, became part of this uh, earth centered uh, legal system. Uh, and so we saw value in that and we're taking part in that. That's part of prophecy. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? And I think there's a mic. There's one there and then two over here. Okay. How should non-indigenous peoples get involved with... I can't hear you. How do non-indigenous peoples get involved with your organization? Um, that's a good question. We are a network of indigenous peoples. So our mandates and our priority is to work with indigenous uh, communities and tribal nations as well, where we're asked and where we're invited. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't work with non-indigenous peoples. Uh, again, that goes along with our teachings, our prophecies, is that we have a responsibility to also uh, work with non-indigenous peoples. We're doing that now within uh, the Climate Justice Alliance, we're doing that with now another alliance of alliances called It Takes Roots. You can Google search that. That's with the uh, uh, Right to the City, big national uh, initiative, uh, CJA, Climate Justice Alliance, uh, Grassroots of Global Justice, and IEN. And every one of these alliances have membership, membership constituency. Um, come from communities, some of them come from communities with labor as well. So we're, we're building the power of the people of, the, of, of America, but also uh, globally. Uh, so we have a commitment, you know, for that. Uh, if you come to our website, you can say, hey, I have a question. We have different organizers around different focuses. So we welcome anyone that says, hey, you know, I want to plug in. How can I plug in? and uh, uh, how can we work together? Uh, there were two hands up here, one here.
university divesting from fossil fuel extractor, extractors. So keep your eye out for things like that. So this is where we have intersections. We, we want the same thing, but we go about, we're doing different kinds of things using the powers that we have at Villanova University to do what we can. So just keep your eye out for things like that as well. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, thank you so much for um, sharing uh, your words of wisdom with us. Um, I had a question in, um, I think, in speaking to many of my friends and other people who are uh, talking about climate change and the work for environmental justice. Um, many people have climate anxiety, like the problems are so large that um, you, you don't even know where to begin and it's just easier, it's almost easier to want to stay as we are. Um, so uh, I was just wondering what uh, advice you would give um, to people who are experiencing that climate anxiety. Definitely what you said really resonates with me. It resonates with all of our organizers. Um, you know, our people within our network and people with other alliances that we network with, our people, they, they want solutions. What, what I did not go into, and when we talk about capitalism, we talk about economic structures, we talk about patriarchy, we talk about community empowerment, um, we talk about racism, we talk about classism. And it seems like what I pick up is kind of People are looking deep for something to hold on to. They're looking for solutions, especially this generation. Um, and not quite finding it here and there, over there, here, you know. Those are real things that we are struggling with on creating the narrative, on creating the story. Um, and I must say, a lot of the organizers that have been part of these different circles are really grappling with this. How do we create a narrative for change that builds power? Because in, in the US, we're so dependent on fossil fuels that people get scared. In Minnesota, if we're against nuclear energy and, and fossil fuels, they say, you want us to freeze to death in the winter, you know? So how do we build solutions in our neighborhoods, in our communities, urban and rural? How do we do that? Uh, we have been involved with some circles. I like in Europe for the Paris uh, Conference of the Party in 2015, there was a big movement in Europe called Altern Alternative Nia. Alternative, alternative NEMA, alternative. It's a group fighting for change, it's alternative. They're completely disconnecting from the electrical grid. For our network for energy on the rural reservations, we've been advocating microgrids. We're very cautious on utility scale uh, wind turbine development or, or solar at a utility scale because our communities don't receive the benefits from that. It, our energy we develop at that level of solar panels and, and, and turbines, it gets lost in the colonial federal grid line is what I call it. Sure, we can say, well, it comes, trickles back to your community in this and this way, but we're thinking outside of that box and also reevaluating what is our true energy need, whether it's a community of Cannonball and Standing Rock, or whether it's the Blackfeet tribe in Montana, or whether it's the uh, 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 Dinef people where we are phasing out the coal-fired power plants, and how do we make a, a just transition for the workers. So that's where we are engaged with looking at the, what is our energy needs for the next 50 years, the next 70 years. What's our food systems that we need to raise our own food and survive? Uh, what's our economy? What's our economic 
when we say indigenous economy, what does that really mean to us? And what does it mean to neighborhood uh, economies where we're not just isolated as an American Indian reservation, there's other counties around that reservation. Um, so it's where we're, we are looking deep in that analysis to respond to questions like that. I think I'm ready for one more question. I think there was somebody else back there. Uh, Somewhere is back there. I saw a little. There we go. Okay, I'll do it. Um, so I was really interested in what you were talking about with the indigenous jurisprudence and how you see that connecting to um, sort of the rights of nature language. Because I, I think about rights as being a very Eurocentric Western sort of political philosophy. Do you see those? How do you see those things sort of working together? Uh, yes. Um, if that's too complicated, then you don't have to do it. Well, now. I think I think I think we need to look at the, at the legal system that we have, not in, just here in the United States, but throughout the world. Uh, part of the '90s, uh, I was more engaged with challenging the U.S. EPA and its structure and its system. They have an international office. They travel throughout the world, pushing. U.S.-based environmental protection mechanisms. Uh, and, and of course, there's debate about whether or not environmental management, regulatory systems really, you know, stop the production and the release of toxic chemicals. It allows you to look into risk management and how risk management is used uh, and uh, based upon assumptions. So I used to really look, look into that into the 90s as we were building a response from our tribes who were developing our own tribal environmental protection programs uh, under Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, our solid waste area, uh, cleanup, Superfund sites, uh, and even developing our own TIPA, our own Tribal Environmental uh, Policy Act that goes a little bit stronger than NEPA, for an example, to where we're lifting up our jurisdiction, we're lifting up our authority, uh, and that, uh, that means challenging some of the laws that came out of Congress that limits uh, American Indian and Alaska Native uh, jurisdiction and authority to protect and implement our own laws. The Montana rule, whoever is the legal beagle here, uh, write that down, research the Montana rule that really challenged uh, uh, the right for tribes to assert its jurisdiction beyond the political boundaries of our reservation. Oklahoma is a product of this right now, of this issue. And uh, so our jurisprudence, the, uh, the, my feeling is that the U.S. government has always prohibited and limited uh, the right that we have, the inherent rights, the inherent relationship we have with nature, with biodiversity, with our water, our air, our animals, and it goes on and on like a, like a star blanket. Uh, it goes on and on, that relationship to nature. Uh, it, it, it's limited that time and time again, as if they know they have to limit who we are as indigenous peoples. They don't like this terminology, okay? Uh, so that's, that's uh, it's, a, it's a new area. Uh, we have a, um, a lawyer, a nominee, uh, and he's been talking with traditional people, knowledge holders, He's been talking with other native attorneys and lawyers. Uh, some are not practicing attorneys in the way that they have that little shingle out. Uh, they just want to work as lawyers. Uh, and policymakers, uh, women's societies. So he's been on a tour through Canada and through the US talking to people about what I'm talking about. And, and a lot of folks are ready to start lifting up 
um, our own uh, uh, indigenous jurisprudence, our own mechanism. And Canada really feels threatened by that, and so does the United States. So uh, with that, uh, yeah, I'm sorry I'm getting a little bit tired here. And uh, uh, yeah, they, the system, the matrix, uh, they tried to prevent me from coming again. <laughs> Uh, I supposed to have left Bemidji yesterday about 5.30 p.m. and the plane kept being delayed till 10 o'clock or so at night and there's no flight coming in here. So I, I said, okay, I'm gonna fly out in the morning. And uh, it wasn't that easy either, even though Delta said we can find you something. But I got here, um, I had to drive two hours to Brainerd. Anyone know, anyone from Minnesota? Where from? Okay. Anyone else? Does Iowa count? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. We're, we're, sure. We're, we're, yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, yeah, I had to drive from Bemidji to Brainerd. Uh, one hour and 47 minutes. It took one hour and uh, 52 minutes. Uh, yeah. So, anyway. So, but I appreciate again, thank you for uh, inviting me and uh, you can go, you can visit our website, ienearth.org and we have a lot of the documents and things that we, we've developed. Uh, uh, we did pull the old website and it just has a lot of archived material. That's our challenge. We accumulate so much and people want so much of knowledge that, uh, but it gets too cluttered so we're also challenge with what do we pull out from our old website that has a whole bunch of stuff in there and, and create and put it into our, our, our current website. So, and uh, let me just take this yeah, divestment. Well, uh, if you know of uh, any native person that wants to do divestment work, reinvestment, we have a vacant position. Uh, so that's a big area for us. We've networked with other organizations that are engaged in, in divestment, like Rainforest Action Network, for an example. So uh, it's a big area for us. And uh, yeah, we like to come back here to Villanova and uh, talk with folks upstairs and talk with folks. I understand that this is a debate. It's a debate in a lot of uh, uh, higher education institutions and uh, our colleagues and our folks in Berkeley and California have had their challenges as well. But there have been wins um, and there needs to be more work. Uh, and I think it's tied to, you know, where is it that we want to go as humanity? And it's very, very important to reevaluate that relationship that we have, that you have, that your family has, that your community has to the sacredness of Mother Earth. What is that? Does that mean we go back and look at Europe? What's the significance of the woman of the lake? What is the significance of the woman of the lake? In those stories, the midwives in Ireland. Why is it something that the old tribal ways were taken away? I saw a diagram in, in, in the Vatican when the, the last pope was buried and they had a computer illustration. Down where they put those, were they tombs? I don't know. But it, it's in the shape of a turtle. It's in shape of a turtle. I saw it right there on CNN. <laughs> I switched it really quick to MSNBC, I saw the same diagram. I don't think Fox News, I don't think they picked it up. But, uh, <laughs> but it was in the shape of a turtle. And I've been to Europe, I've talked to folks, I've talked to colleagues that are in the church. And uh, yeah, the church is old. It understands what it's called mysticism. It probably has stacks and volumes of steadies on all this relationship that I'm talking about. So how do we break loose this knowledge? It's a knowledge of compassion and love for the beauty of our ina unchimaka. Mini wichoni, 
You all heard that coming out of uh, Standing Rock, Dakota Access Pipeline, Mini, Mini Wichoni. And what does that mean? Mini, the water of life, Mini Wichoni. I don't have time to give it credit of the whole translation of that word, but it does involve the importance and the role of our woman in life. Some words long time ago in that spiritual, that profound spiritual knowledge that our knowledge holders had is when life is coming from our mother who has a baby inside, is the passing of the water. The passing of that water. So now the world has a better understanding of this concept water is life, many wachoni, but many don't know the significance of what that means and the role of our woman and the precious, the passing of the water of life, the coming of the baby. And what does that mean as far as building the values and the ethics of how we exist of humanity? We have an initi initiative around indigenous water ethics as well. And uh, so again, thank you. I can go on. I was teasing, I think, Katie, Kat, Katie, Katie. I was teasing. I said, I can go on for three hours, <laughs> yeah, four hours, two days. But I got to go. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah. <laughs>